Hello again, welcome back. Today we are talking about the J. Bildner years, and that is Jim Bildner, and J. Bildner and Sons is the name, or was the name, of a supermarket chain in Brookline, Massachusetts, in the Coolidge Corner area. I worked at J. Bildner and Sons in the early 90s as a grocery department manager and it was a rather interesting experience. It was uh, a lesson in how to watch a business fail. It was an upscale type of market, you know, that it wasn't like your typical supermarket. It was an upscale market. There were five before daddy died, Jim Bildner Sr. and when he died and left it to Jim Jr., um, Jim spent up so much of it that there were three stores left by the time I was working there. And it really seemed to me like he was sabotaging it. He eventually ended up going bankrupt, and I think he did it on purpose. I think he ran into, into the ground on purpose because he had many opportunities for things to be fixed. He didn't want them fixed. He wanted to play store rather than run one. Well, there were a lot of things that were wrong with the store. Um, for one thing, people working there that didn't need to be there. He had managers for everything, and it was unnecessary. Just in the store I was in, on uh, close to Harvard Ave there in Brookline, was the flag store. So it was the main store. His office was upstairs, and he had, like, for example, the flower department had three employees in the flower department, which was like this little place. It was not like a big department. Three employees and a manager in the flower department, but the flowers were delivered. Um, nobody ordered them. Somebody came and handled that. So why do you have a flower department manager making like 1500 bucks a week in the early 90s when their job serves no function? They, that person basically wandered all around the store all day and did nothing. But she was a major kiss ass. Um, a general store manager, while you have a day and a night general store manager. So you had a general store manager to manage two other general store managers. Makes no sense. A productivity manager um, to oversee all the managers in the store to make sure, or actually all the employees rather, not just the managers, but to oversee everybody to get maximum efficiency out of them, which he did not do, actually. He kind of was the opposite of that. Things like this. It just didn't make any sense. He probably could have saved five, $6,000 a, a week, rather, just by eliminating three or four of these unnecessary jobs. Well, the first thing that I did was discovered that they didn't return anything. When something was damaged, broken, uh, spoiled, whatever, they were throwing it away. And this is the way it had always been done, apparently. And I was like, well, why don't you try to return any of the stuff? Unheard of. They didn't even know you could. I found out that from all of our vendors, the procedures for returning damaged goods and started that process. So that saved actually a lot of money. I mean, who throws it all away? It was a bonehead practice, and I'm amazed that the market was run like that with nobody knowing the difference. Um, I got in contact with all of our vendors because we had, and here you go, uh, here's another example. We had a, a wine department manager who didn't even know who his own vendors were. He didn't place orders with the wine. The vendors were coming in and setting the stuff up themselves. This guy did nothing. So I, I spoke to the vendors because the receiving department was connected to the grocery department. So I oversaw the receiving and I spoke to the vendors and got them to come in and do take, uh, demonstrations and taste tests and things like that and coordinate with the cheese department because it was a gourmet cheese department and set up samples for customers and I arranged some events that way, which drew a lot of attention to 
to those departments and helped out. I saved them probably, God, about $800 to $1,000 a month by rearranging how they shut the lights off at night. And it adds up. It's a big deal. I mean, the grocery department and the deli department are the two biggest sellers in the market, or were, because, well, the deli department is connected to the catering. They had a catering service. So they made a lot of money, and the grocery department made a lot of money. It was important to keep that running smoothly. And I butted heads on a few other things, like he wanted it to be this upscale gourmet market, and his answer to everything was to keep raising the prices, which is ineffective. You keep raising the prices, you drive your customers off. You don't, especially like I said, early 90s, you know, it's 92, 93, you don't charge, um, you don't charge like almost $2 for a two liter of soda when you can go across the street to, to the Walgreens and get it for 89 cents. That doesn't make sense. He kept pushing for the prices to be increased constantly. It's like, Jim, that doesn't work that way. I know what I'm doing. My father was a grocer and on and on and on. I know I'm rambling, but it was just irritating. Jim was a prick and he was a, a wannabe socialite and he loved brown nosers. Like I said, he had these people working there that didn't need to be there simply because they kissed his ass. There's no other explanation for it. The, these are the people that walked around and called him big guy all day long. Hey, big guy, or how you doing today, big guy? And Or, oh God, this one that really killed me. He was whistling this one day and one of the one of the store, I think it was the day store manager, comes up on him and is like, wow, I sure wish I could whistle like that big guy. And I'm like, what is wrong with these people? Where do you find people like this? I, could, I couldn't do it. Jim hated me. I couldn't do it. And, you know, no matter what I did for him to help, to try and help that store, he never, he never once acknowledged it, said thank you or anything. No acknowledgement whatsoever. But all these kiss asses and suck ups, he loved them. He was surrounded with them constantly. This is the guy, and I, I tried to find the article, I really did, so that I could put it up here and show you to give you a demonstration of what I'm talking about. He was in the, the newspaper in the Boston Globe at one point because of a donation that he had made to the Wang Center, which is what rich people in Boston do. They make a donation to the Wang Center so they can get their name engraved on a on a seat or some crap. But he had made a donation to the Wang Center and they interviewed him. And I will never forget this because of how arrogant it was. A quote from him in the paper, I am but a simple grocer, but when you are young, dynamic, and glamorous like me, it's hard to stay simple for long. I promise you that's what it said. That was a quote that was out of his own mouth to the newspaper. I couldn't believe that he would have the arrogance to say that. It was absolutely incredible. But that was him. That's how how awful, terrible, arrogant he was. Yeah, something else Jim used to do that irritated everybody. I know all oh, the poor guy that used to have to uh, clean the offices. He went around and, uh, and emptied all the barrels and stuff like that. Oh, he hated Jim because of uh, the coffees. Jim had this habit of he would get a large, like super-sized coffee from downstairs at the deli department because, you know, the coffee was free to him. And he would bring it upstairs and he'd take like a sip out of it and then drop it in the uh, in the barrel. He just throw it away. He just wanted a sip. But he would get this huge cup. He would get like this 44-ounce cup of freaking coffee to, to get that sip out of it. And he'd do that like five or six times a day. And, uh, and then he, when, when, uh, Carlos would go up there to, to empty out the trash, he'd be like, yeah, watch out a couple of bombs in there. And of course, you know, that can't, the bag that's in there can't contain that. And so it, it would be a disaster. He'd have to take the whole barrel out. He'd have to dump it. He'd have to wash it out. And he'd be like, yeah, I'll give you a bomb, you son of a bitch. <laughs> what an awful thing to do. I I don't know what he was thinking.
Yeah, productivity manager, Bill Johns. Bigger asshole is, is what his name should have been, Bill Johns. He was an old guy, and he was awful, awful to people. You know, the pr purpose of a productivity manager, of course, is to get efficiency. But his idea of getting efficiency was to treat everybody like garbage. To, and actually, I got into arguments with him on a few occasions. Uh, two occasions because um, he was browbeating a, ca a cashier so badly, or twice, two female cashiers, two different occasions, browbeating them so badly they started to cry. And so, I mean, I got in his face about it. It's like, Bill, why don't you, uh, why don't you tear on me? Why don't you uh, try to push me? And uh, he'd ramble on about how I don't understand and all this other stuff. His idea of being uh, authoritarian was to break people down, I guess. And some people he couldn't do it with. So, yeah, uh, Bill hated me, too. But th that's how he treated people. He was that awful. He, um, I remember once in a meeting, he, he gets on my case about pricing. He was like, listen. I don't know what, uh, I, don't, I don't remember what started the argument. It, it was a manager's meeting, and he was like, listen, you, who do you think it is that sets the prices around here? And I was like, I do, Bill. That's my job. Are you trying to make a point, or did you not realize that? He was so furious, but it was the truth. That was my job. I'm the one that uh, calculated all the prices. I don't know where he was going with that. It didn't, it didn't make any sense. Another good one that really stands out for me was when he, he some project he wanted me to do. And he was like, listen, when I hired you, I hired you to help out around here. And I was like, Bill, I was here a year before you. You did not hire me. What are you talking about? I, sometimes I wonder if he was just senile because of how old he was. Yeah, eventually lost my job. And what had happened was this was during the time that I was actually still with Stacy, who was the mother of uh, Warren and Toby. Uh, we were still together and she worked there and she worked in the bakery department. And her job was to come in in the morning and open up the bakery department and get it going, starting it up. And there was some kind of conflict where they said that the time that she had put in didn't coincide with the time that she had actually entered because you have to shut off the alarm in the department to to get in through there through that side door and they said that that alarm was turned off at a later time than when she had punched in I don't know whether that was a glitch or or whether they made that up or whether she actually stole the time. Um, I, I can't answer that. I have no idea. But they had fired her based on that. And they let me go. They said they were eliminating my position. And basically what had happened was they figured, well, if we get rid of her since they're together dating whatever, we better get rid of him too so that he doesn't try to sabotage us is probably what they were thinking. And so I got, I got laid off and so that's how I fell out from, uh, Builder and Sons, although they didn't last much longer. Uh, shortly after I had left, oh, less than a year, he had finished losing all, all of the stores. They closed, I, I I can't remember where the third remaining store was, but it closed. The second one that was downtown went down. And then finally the one in Coolidge Corner closed. And it was over. It was over for the uh, so-called legacy of Jim Builder and Sons markets. They, they didn't last. They could have. There was potential for him to, to restore the operation, but he just wouldn't take it. He was too busy trying to pretend to be a socialite. Trying to deal with uh, vendors on behalf of Jim was extremely difficult because he had a very bad reputation with them. I remember the produce department was getting their produce delivered all the way from New Jersey. And they had to buy a ton of apple cider in order to facilitate that. 
because of the uh, weight requirements on the truck and certain things like that. I don't remember what the deal was exactly. I, it was explained to me by the uh, produce manager, but I don't remember all of it. But they had to have the truck uh, uh, with a certain amount of stuff and a certain weight in order to get them to come all the way from New Jersey to Brookline, Massachusetts to, to deliver the produce. And I'm like, why the hell are we getting produce all the way from New Jersey? So I called around to local New England farms, which, you know, you should, if you have a market, you should deal with local farms anyways. It just makes sense. So I, I, I call around and, and as soon, you know, they were like, oh yeah, sure. We'd love to, uh, to work with you. And then as soon as I said, uh, Builder and Sons, they were like, oh, wait a minute. No, no, I can't. And after I got through about 15 or so different farms rejecting me and telling me, no, we, uh, no way, not with Jim Builder. Um, I gave up and the reason that all of those places rejected it is because he owed them all money. All of them. It was incredible. Just picking randomly, uh, local farms that pro uh, provided produce, every single one of them he owed money to, he had stiffed. And he was getting the stuff all the way from New Jersey. And what I found out later on was that the farm he was getting it from in New Jersey was his brother's farm. And that his brother would not take an order or would not send an order out until it was paid for first. So his own brother didn't trust him. Incredible. Yeah, a lot of interesting things happened in there. One thing that was real interesting that I thought was funny was uh, a lot of celebrities used to come through there. Uh, nothing too major, like, you know, the local news people shopped in there and like David Copperfield sh uh, shopped in there a few times and, you know, some local athletes, like a couple of Celtics players and um, Patriots, a baseball player, stuff like that would come in. And I thought it was funny because of how everybody would scramble for these people. And like the 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 manager, whether it was the day manager or the night manager or whoever, would bump the cashier to ring that person out personally. And I thought that was hilarious. It's like you let the cashier do their job. Like like uh, so and so, like David Copperfield gives a crap who you are. That <laughs> you're gonna go and ring up his order for him. Are you going to be besties now? It didn't make any damn sense. I, I can't remember his name, but it was the lead singer from the Cars also uh, went in there a couple of times. And I saw him in there. And I remember he, he comes around the corner. I was uh, doing the milk order. And he comes around and he bumps into me. And he's like, oh, excuse me, man. I'm like, yeah, okay, no problem. And he goes on, and then this like little tight little mob of people, mostly employees, comes around the corner. It's like fifteen of them, and they're like, "Did he say something to you?" And I'm like, "What? Uh, yeah. What did he say? Excuse me. W what's the big deal?" I never understood any of that, but I thought it was hilarious. It's an interesting observation in how people act around uh, so-called celebrities. It's no wonder they all go crazy. <laughs> yeah, the name tag gag. Uh, what that is, is that we knew that Jim Bildner did not pay attention to anybody. He was, he was in his own little world when he used to come into the store. So what we would do is in the receiving desk, which was right by the back door, uh, was a collection of name tags because I used to make the name tags for the employees. I had a machine downstairs and I had a, t a ton of them. And so when we saw Jim coming, because uh, he would park in the back and he would come into the store, we'd switch them around or we'd get extra ones out of the, out of the drawer and put them on and he would come in and address the person and say the name that was on the tag every time, even to me. And I've run in his grocery department. I he used to do it with me all the time. I put a tag on Richard and he'd be like, oh, good morning, Richard. And it wasn't like he was playing along. 
he really just didn't know who the hell everybody was, even his own managers. <laughs> he, he didn't know who anybody was. That's how that's how much uh, the people that worked for him meant to uh, Jim Bilner. No, I didn't regret working there. It didn't matter that I wasn't appreciated. You know, I don't work somewhere to be appreciated. I work somewhere to do my job and get paid. Um, I don't need somebody to stroke my ego on the job. So it didn't matter to me that, uh, that Jim didn't like me and Bill didn't like me and that my labors for the store to try to help them were largely ignored it doesn't matter you know you don't really work for another person so much as you work for yourself and represent yourself so what they think of you doesn't matter as long as you're doing what you need to be doing and i did what i was supposed to do um and it was a it was a an interesting experience so no i don't regret having ever worked there